Flight attendants, please prepare for takeoff. Stolen by Ehlers to Wheeler, back to Ehlers, scores! Kyle Connor has the Midas touch right now! And another outstanding stop by Connor Hellebuck! Right to shoot, score! Oh, what a slick move by Mark Sightly! Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets, hosted by Jets TV. Hello and welcome and thank you for downloading another episode of Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets, joined here over Zoom with Paul Edmonds of 680 CJOB and Jets TV's Mitchell Clinton. Gentlemen, uh, the team has returned to Winnipeg for another week of Winnipeg Jets hockey. But before we look ahead to this week coming up, uh, Paul, just a quick recap of this week. Obviously, the Winnipeg Jets pick up six of a possible eight points, including a nail-biting 4-3 win over the Vancouver Canucks late on Sunday night. Just what did you see from the Winnipeg Jets this week that helped them pick up the 6 of 8? Well, I think, number one, it starts in goal. They got a great performance from Warren Brossois and a couple from Connor Hellebuck. I mean, maybe he didn't like the first period in Vancouver of the last game, but when the game got a little bit tight, there he was to kind of make the saves and allow the Winnipeg Jets to get back into the game. So... It was probably the only misstep that they had was the one game against the Edmonton Oilers that they didn't like. But overall, you get out of Edmonton, a pretty decent team with a lot of offensive skill and a goaltender in Mike Smith that rebounded after the second game um, or in the second game after the first game where he wasn't uh, probably his usual self. He gets pulled and you get out of there with uh, a win and a loss and you're okay. And then you go into Vancouver, you beat them. And then you know that the pushback is going to come and there was some unpleasantness and the Winnipeg Jets kind of handled that as well. So overall, I think it was a real good week for the Winnipeg Jets from the standpoint that they picked up some points. They improved their record on the road, proved their record overall, uh, ascended in the standings into third. They were in fourth when they embarked on the trip. And not only that, but I think more importantly, pushed another team in Vancouver a little further behind them. So you're starting to see some separation between the upper echelon in the Scotia and HL's North Division, along with the teams that are kind of fighting it uh, on the bottom of the of the standings. Speaking of good weeks, Mark Scheifele continues to be on his toward pace. He ties a career high 10 game point streak. He's got seven goals and nine assists over that span, including a five game goal scoring streak. Mitchell, obviously the points are there for Mark right now, but what are you seeing in his game that's allowing him to have that success? Well, everything. And like, you know, I'll get to that point uh, just in a sec, but like you, you mentioned like the point streak he's on, the goal streak that he's on. I mean, I was looking into it a little bit today. He's tied for fourth in the league in points going into action on Monday night with his 26. But the other thing to, to keep in mind is if you break that down even further, 20 of those 26 points are at even strength. That puts him only one back of McDavid and Marner in the National Hockey League. So, you know, a a lot of times, you know, you think about guys, you know, picking up a bunch of points on the power play. For Mark Scheifele, only six of his points are on the power play. He's done a lot of his damage at even strength. And the other thing that that really stands out, especially when you look at the, the last Vancouver game of the road trip, I thought, the three goals really summed up what he's doing really well. So you got Dubois' first goal. It's Scheifele that wins the board battle below the goal line in the offensive zone, which he's one of the best on the team, if not in the league at, you know, playing below the dots and maintaining possession and uh, not being knocked off the puck. So he keeps that play alive. And then that obviously leads immediately to Wheeler's backdoor pass to Dubois. Boom. There's one. The second goal, it's Shifley's pressure on Brock Besser in the defensive zone that leads to the puck getting out. And then he's uses his speed to take off the other way. Of course, takes a, fantastic pass from uh, from Blake Wheeler in the neutral zone goes down the ice and finishes it off and then on the overtime winner you know as much as it's you know three forwards out on the ice and you're thinking offense and everything and, and I thought it was interesting to hear um, a lot of the players break it down that you're essentially man-to-man defense uh, throughout that situation I thought it was interesting that even in that scenario when Blake Wheeler forces the turnover in the Jets zone, Shifley being in a really good support position and the Jets talk about playing connected, Shifley being in that really good support position, um, even at three on three is what allowed the Jets to transition as quickly as they did, which got Pierre-Luc Dubois in that situation to go up against Brock Besser one-on-one in overtime. So those three points uh, that he had last night 
all kind of encapsulate what he's been doing so well for the Winnipeg Jets, especially over the course of this stretch. Well, hopefully he can keep that streak alive as the Winnipeg Jets host the Montreal Canadiens coming up on Thursday at Bell MTS Place. Paul, Lauren Brossois, a really interesting case. I, he played absolutely well, he played perfect hockey on Friday night in British Columbia. He kept his shutout streak alive in Vancouver. He's now made 88 straight saves, 88 of 88 in BC. Um, just what have you seen from him? And, and how does that help the Winnipeg Jets when you have a backup goalie running like he sort of did two years ago where he just was sort of automatic knock on wood? Well, it is a real good one-two punch. The priority for goaltending in the National Hockey League is always going to be your number one goaltender. He's always going to get the most reps. You're always going to be most concerned about him getting the rest and him staying in rhythm. So it's important for the backup goaltender to adjust to that. And I asked Paul Maurice if Lauren Brossois was the epitome of a perfect backup. And his answer was simply, yes, he is, because he prepares the same way as to whether he's going to play that night or the next night as if he's not going to play. So his preparation is the same just in case there's an injury or somebody has to come out and he has to go in for whatever reason, he's ready to go. And the fact that, boy, there's a real good relationship between Connor Hellebuck and Lauren Brossois. So while they have some internal competition, no question about it, and push each other, it's a real good relationship that they have. They want to see each other succeed. And because I think it's such a difficult position, goaltending number one, but being the backup goaltender, there's a couple things. You have to be a part of it. You have to feel like you are part of the big picture on the team, even though you're not playing every game. And then through that, you also have to play and be adept at your playing when you get those minutes and those opportunities because you want to have the trust of the players in front of you. They want to feel and you want to feel like they're relying on you and that they can rely on you. And Lord Rossois has delivered that for the last three years for the Winnipeg Jets. It's interesting because he's on another one-year contract. He's an unrestricted free agent at the end of this year. He's 27 years old. His numbers are very, very good. He's really taken off in Winnipeg. He's got the opportunity here. He's played in 20 and then almost 20 again. And then we'll see what this year is as well, because last year was shortened down because of the pandemic and the start of it and the pause. And then this year because of the 56 game schedule, but I would imagine he'll still get somewhere between, you know, 15 to 17 starts. And we'll see what he does with that. You know what you're going to get from Lauren Brossois, and that's going to be a guy that tracks the puck very well, slides post to post efficiently, and also really controls his rebounds and works hard to make sure that when he gets thrust into the net, he's going to be there for you. The next question is, what happens to Lauren in the future? Does Lauren want more? And when you get to this situation where you are adept and very good at the position that you're in, and you want to achieve something more, well, that might be in a starter's role. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's looking toward that. Right now, I don't think that if you asked him a question, Tyler, about that, that he would want to answer that. But I have to think bigger picture after this year, if it continues to go the way it has for him, not just this season through four starts, and he's three and one, by the way, over those four starts, but over the last three years, that Lauren Brostwall will be looking for something, and there might be something somebody else that's looking for something in Lauren Brossois to maybe give them a one and one a kind of scenario in the goaltending future in the national hockey league. So let's keep an eye out on that. But for right now, he's part of the Winnipeg jets and he's been a big part of the Winnipeg jets for the last three seasons. Yeah. Like you mentioned, you look at the way he's played over the last three seasons and, you know, coming off of his time in, in short time in Calgary and Edmonton stick taps to Chevy on identifying him as a as a solid backup for Connor Hellebuck. Mitch, uh, speaking of Chevy, he brings in Pierre-Luc Dubois, and obviously I don't think he gets off to the start that he wants, clearly uh, plays a couple of games and then goes down with injury, but he returns to the lineup, scores his first goal, then wins it in overtime, and he's everybody's favorite Jet. Uh, what did you think of Pierre-Luc Dubois' debut, debut, re-debut? I don't know how you <laughs> would call that. Re-debut of Dubois? Yes. Uh yeah, I, it was fantastic. I mean, you, first off, and I, I fully agree with uh, what Paul Maurice said after the game, you just feel good for for Pierre-Luc. Like, 
you could just tell after you got that first goal, just the amount of weight that, that came off of his shoulders, you know, just having that puck go in the back of the net. Um, I think it, I think it helped him a lot. And, you know, obviously, like you mentioned, he comes over in the trade, he's got the two week quarantine and plays a couple of games. And he says, you know, that first game, I don't really even want to talk about it. It wasn't, wasn't something that he was that happy with. He gets a little bit more comfortable in that second game. And then, yeah, like, like you said, he's off for four games with the injury. And I, I'm just happy for him that he was able to, uh, that he was able to play the way that he did. He gets the first goal, gets that weight off his shoulders. Then in the third period, he sets up Neil Pionk on that one timer. And then the overtime goal, I thought it was really cool to kind of hear him break it down. Like a lot of times you, you ask players, you know, can you take me through what you saw and, and everything like that. And to varying degrees, you get different answers. And I thought it was really cool to hear him break down his thoughts of the fact that he heard it was potentially a three on two uh, noticing the player that he was up against Brock Besser is clearly a forward deciding to make that move to the net then showing the power he has to hold off Besser and then make and then get that puck up fast enough to beat Braden Holtby I thought it was really encapsulates uh what Pierre-Luc Dubois can bring to the Winnipeg Jets and clearly he's a center he's not going to play wing all the time but if you're head coach Paul Maurice you love having that option in your back pocket of Wheeler, Shifley and Dubois their first game together they combined for nine points and Dubois says he can still be even better so obviously I think that was just a big big night for Pierre-Luc Dubois and of course the Winnipeg Jets as well yeah and I think the, the fans of the Winnipeg Jets should be really excited to see uh how he fares going forward with the team uh our next interview on episode 95 of Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets, is with Alan Pritchard, the team's massage therapist and fourth unofficial equipment guy. <laughs> uh, I had the chance to sit down with uh, Pritchie, as we call him, uh, around the locker room uh, to talk about a bunch of different things, including how he got started with the, with the team in hockey, uh, his bonds that he has with players and those relationships and a whole lot more, so enjoy the interview. Hi, this is Mark Shifley, and you're listening to Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets. Joined here by Alan Pritchard, the massage therapist for the Winnipeg Jets. I feel like you deserve a much better intro than that uh, because of the type of guy that you are, but, uh, you know, I've kind of had a loss for words um, on how to introduce you. You're a man of many talents. Uh, Like I said, you're the massage therapist, but you're the unofficial, official, you know, fourth equipment guy. Uh, you're a man that wears many different hats. Um, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's uh, it, it's an exciting time. Uh, first podcast ever. It's uh, it's probably a pretty good time for me to be on here because uh, no one can see my face. So just hear your voice. So it's it's a great time for me. It's uh, it's exciting. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so we're going to get into a few different topics, but I guess we'll start by the most obvious question. You know, how did you get into becoming the massage therapist for the Winnipeg Jets? Um, it goes back to my, uh, best friend Hilti, uh, when he got the, the head equipment job with the Manitoba Moose, he asked me if I wanted to become, uh, a game day guy with the Moose and, uh, obviously jumped at that opportunity. And, um, that was the same year that, uh, Mike Flamin came on Flamer and we became, uh, game day guys together and, you know, just filling bottles and, you know, folding towels and taking care of the guys on game days and, uh, we did all the games together, uh, all the home games, and uh, Hilti got me on. And, you know, I did a little bit of massage that year, but not a whole lot. I got to go that year, actually, uh, Mullet, the head athletic therapist, asked me if I wanted to go to Thunder Bay for, um, they had um, a two-game two game, uh, tour there, um, some exhibition games. Yeah. And I got to go out there, and that was a really good opportunity because got to sit down and have a meal with, you know, the head coach at the time, Scott O'Neill, and got to know the staff and, you know, got to earn some trust there and, and got to meet the guys and hang out with them. And Brad Berry was there and, and, and really got to to see and, and see how the wheels would turn with the team and, and got to see a lot of the moving parts with how the equipment side of things was and and got to meet more of of the guys when it was more relaxed atmosphere and and things like that and uh you know really got treated like i was part of the staff because you know mike Keane was on the team then and and he really embraced the fact that you know this 
rookie Schmelt was on the road with them. And, yeah. you know, I was really just there to drive the truck and, and move stuff around. And it was, uh, he treated me like I was, you know, a 20 year vet and he always did. And, you know, he gave me a hard time and, you know, it, you know, it was uh, a really good time for me to see how things were and how they, they operated and stuff. So, um, that's where we were and and it was it was a fun time in Thunder Bay and we were there just for a couple of days and got a couple of games under my belt there um, but that's how we uh, got involved with the uh, moose and I stuck on for for a couple of years there and then when the uh, Jets were announced uh, Rob once again got to select his his staff and he called me up and just said you know Pritch I I got to uh, I got to select my massage therapist and want to know if you would uh, you consider taking the job. And obviously, that's going to be a job that you know I've dreamt my whole life of, sure. of becoming the massage therapist in the NHL. But you know, you got to talk to your wife and and family about that one because you're going to be away a lot of the time and and things like that. But it is a dream come true, and it is your dream job once you you know, once I took the massage course, you know, you stand up in day one of massage therapy class and you say, you know, I want to become the massage therapist in, in the NHL. And everyone laughs at you because of course it's not a reality, right? Yeah. Like, so, you know, it, it is a dream come true. It's a, it's a job that you, you know, you dream of, you know, you wanted it your whole life and, and you wanted to, you know, do this your whole life. So, um, through Hilti and through mullet, you know, your dreams come, come true. And, uh, that was that was how it came to fruition and and uh next thing you know my wife and I sat down and we had a lengthy conversation and she just said you know I'm not going to stop you from fulfilling this dream and yeah. and we uh we did decide to go with it and uh you know we're 10 years later we're we're still doing it and and we're making making do so so you talked about it there, you know, talking to your wife and it's a big commitment, you know, even for myself, I travel full time as well. And it's, it's definitely something that's difficult and it weighs on you. So how has your brotherhood with Mike Flamin and the other trainers, um, you know, helped you guys and, and yourself on the road when, you know, you're on a long road trip, especially this season, it's going to be a bit different. Just how do you lean on each other and, you know, keep the mood light? Well, it's funny because, you know, every time you tell somebody that you work in the NHL, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, you're living the dream. It's great, you know, right. and they're like, do you travel with the team? And you're like, well, yeah, you do travel with the team because they need a massage therapist. And, you know, and then they think, well, you know, you fly on the big plane and you eat all the expensive meals and everything. Like that. You, sure, it's great. Mm -hmm. Everything's great. But they don't understand that when the plane lands, you have to get off the plane, you get in the truck, you drive to the rink, you unpack the gear, you know, win lose or draw you're you're still going to the rink at two three o'clock in the morning you're unpacking that gear you're going to a practice rink that has no heat that has no fans that you know you're doing all those little things that that are tough and if you if you don't get along with the people that you work with it's going to even be longer so we have seven guys that get along like brothers we you know do we see eye to eye every day no absolutely not but sure, sure, sure. Yeah, but at the end of the day, we do we do get along, and we you know if we have you know if we have arguments or disagreements, we get them out in the air, and we we you know we grieve them, we get rid of them right away. But you know we do everything together. We we spend more time with each other than we do our families in the winter time. So you know we eat together, we drink together, we you know we travel together. We have to unpack that gear. We you know we're around each other all the time. So. We do have a lot of fun, and I think that we're probably one of the best staff that works together well, and we're a well-oiled machine, and, and we just, you know, when we unpack gear, it's, you know, we all know what we're doing, mm -hmm. and we got our job, and we do it, and we just do it efficiently, and we do it well, and we just get it done, and everyone knows what they're doing, so it just gets done properly, and it gets done fast, and, and you get to bed, and then you get back to the rink the next day, and it's done, so it's it's a lot of fun, and we uh, we poke a lot of fun at each other, and we have a lot of fun with it every day, and I think that's the only way to get by because, you know, the days are long, the weeks are long. And I mean, you look, you look forward to the schedule and, you know, we're only at home for three suppers in March. We're at home right. for uh, five sleeps in our own bed in March, like 17 games in 30 nights or whatever it's going to be. It's going to be a long, it's going to be a long, uh, hard fought March for your, your wife and your kids. So, Absolutely. you know, these guys are the guys that you're going to lean on for everything, you know, and, and I mean, the good times and the bad, 
Um, we're there for each other through everything. And these are the guys you lean on, whether, uh, things are good or things are bad. And, and that's the guys that, uh, that are there for you all the time. So, so you talk about the bond that you have with your fellow trainers, but I, I feel like one of the the things that doesn't get talked about is there's such a bond between players and the equipment managers and the medical staff. Now you've been in with the organization since 2011, since the team came back, um, officially, um, you know, you have a relationship with Mark Shifley and other players who you've seen the club draft, you know, just how important and how special is that bond that you have with some of the players and on the team? Yeah. I mean, you can't not like become close to them and it, it's very tough. It, it's, you know, you, you become close to them, you become friends with them and it still is at the end of the day a business and it's very tough. I mean, we've had some very close friends get traded. I mean, Zach Bogosian was here. Um, we had him during the, you know, some good years and during the lockout, we became very close myself and Zach and, you know, he, uh, he was injured during the lockout so we had him here and we worked out with him every day and we treated him every day and you know and then he got traded so the business aspect of it you know it gets you down and and you see him leave and you know it's one of those things that you understand that those things are going to happen but it, it's still tough and you have to get over that because you know it's going to happen and it, it it is a business at the end of the day so you just let that happen and you're not in control of that but you know I still um, still very close with him and you still stay in contact but you know, it's it's one of those things that, you know, you, you see the organization draft a Mark Shifley and you're here right from the get-go with him and, and you're close with him and you get to see him grow up. You know, I saw him when he was 18 and he could barely get the bar off the, the bench press and, <laughs> you know, he still tells me this day he got two and, you know, congratulations. And, yeah, you know, it, it's one of those things that he is, uh, he's just grown up right in front of you and it's it's almost like he's he's your son. Right. And, but, you know, he's your brother and he's your friend and we're so close. And, uh, it, it's one of those things that, uh, you have a lot of those relationships that come and go, but you do stay in touch with those guys. And, you know, the Nick Antropoffs and the Chris Masons and those guys stay in hockey. And, right. you know, Nick comes back to town for some stuff with the alumni and I got in touch with him and went and had a coffee with him. And Chris Mason's working with Nashville. So I get to see him you know, not this year, but you still get to see him. And, you know, the hockey's such a, it's such a huge world, but it's so small at the same time. So it's, and, and the Jets are so good at drafting so well, and we draft quality men and we have such pride in, in drafting good people. Like all of our people that we have in our organization are such good people. So, you know, staying in touch with people is, is important you know, to myself and to everyone. And, and there's so many good people that have come through our organization that I still stay in contact with. So yeah, there's, there's so many guys that have come through that, you know, that I still stay in touch with through, you know, social media or whatever, but like still that I still call and, and still touch base with. So it's great. You talk about this being a dream job. One of the, the factors of this dream job is that, you know, you've been able to bring family on guest trips in years past. How special was that to bring your, your dad was on the trip uh, a couple of years ago. I believe it was your mom this, this time around last season. Yeah. I mean, it, it just goes back to how classy Mark Chipman is and, and the ownership group here. Like that, that trip you see, you see Jay McMaster and his guys put it together and Mark Chipman, you know, has to, you know, flip the bill for that. Like, this is something that is so special for our families. Like, they're the ones that have put us through hockey. And, you know, you know, you sit back and anyone that ever asks you when you're a little kid what you want to do, you want to make the NHL. Well, if you're not a good enough hockey player, you're not going to make it. And, you know, for us, we finally did make it. And to share that with our moms and our dads and you know a little kid from Roland, manitoba making it to the nhl that's so huge and then to take my mom and dad on the trip and then i got to bring my brother and one of my best friends like to show them what i get to do on the road all the time and you know it just it just got to you know like they didn't you know you can tell them all what you do and what you see and all the hotels you stay in but until they get to see it it just you know, when they get to see it and experience it, it just made me so proud Mm -hmm. to show them what I got to, you know, what I get to live. It was one of those things that, you know, it just, 
it, I couldn't put into words how happy they were. And I mean, my mom and dad still go for coffee and tell people and show pictures. And my mom is still contacting all the other mothers. And you're just like, mom, stop talking to me, you know? <laughs> so they had such a good time. And, and, uh, you know, it's, I just, it was just so nice to pay back for all the, the times they threw me in a car and lugged me around in minus 30 weather, taking me hockey rink, hockey rink. And, and, uh, you know, I know my brother appreciated it because, you know, he buys season tickets and he gets to see games, but now, you know, we get to see a couple other rinks and, and just to see all the, the stuff that we get to see every day that, sure. you, you know, you take for granted after a couple of years in the NHL that you're just like, Oh man, it's three in the morning and you're getting off the plane and you're getting in the back of a truck and you're loading the plane and you're, you know, those little things that you, you, you know, sometimes take for granted and, and you shouldn't because this is the best league in the world. And, you know, those things, you know, they could be gone in an instant. And, uh, we, uh, we get into those situations that, you know, there are some tough times when you lose a couple games and you get into that bad mindset that, Oh man, you know, like we're away and we're, you know, you're down on yourself cause you're away from your family for a couple of weeks. And, you know, so when you get to bring those family members and show them off and show them, you know, some of the rinks and down below, like they've never seen that. So it's, it was really special. And I mean, you can't thank Mark Chipman and his, and his group enough. And he just, he's just such a classy guy and, and he just spares no, expense and he takes us out for such a nice supper and I mean my mom and dad both they just they couldn't they couldn't they just they're still talking about it yep. so it's it's great yeah my, my last question for you is where did you learn to get such strong hands you know I've had neck pain before and you have massaged my neck and within five seconds it feels better but it makes me want to cry so um, I guess this also leads into another question have as a player ever cried at your hand no, because it uh, seems like it would be possible. Yeah, no, I don't think anyone's ever cried. Um, no, but I think just the strong hands. Like if you ever see my dad's hands, he's been through a war and back. He's lost some fingers. He's put them through the belts of uh, you know swathers. He's yep. lost his middle finger. His hands are all, but he's got some some bear paws on him. So. Yep. Yeah, you know, I probably just the farmer. You know, you got to have some strong hands being on the farm. I. Uh, yeah, I guess it's just one of those things that if you don't have strong hands, you don't survive on the farm. But uh, no one's cried. But yeah, that's uh, you got to have strong hands to be in this business, I guess, or you're not going to survive. So I, I'm just fortunate with that, I guess. So couldn't have said it better myself. Great way to end the interview. Thanks, Pritch. Thanks. Shop where the players shop. Jets Gear and TrueNorthShop.com are your authentic team stores. Make sure to stock up on all your favorite Winnipeg Jets and Manitoba Moose merchandise today. Visit one of the five Jets Gear locations or shop online at truenorthshop.com. Thank you so much to Pritchie for your time. We appreciate it as always. And uh, I will be hitting you up for another neck massage at some point, I'm sure. And I probably will cry when you do it. So, uh, Paul, looking ahead to this week for the Winnipeg Jets, uh, when you look at the calendar, it is a, a lighter week for the team. Only two games on the schedule on Thursday and Saturday, uh, and then a day off on Sunday. This is a perceived as a, a, a big test for the team. Montreal has been really good this year, very strong, but they find themselves pretty well neck and neck with the Jets in the standings. What are you looking for from Winnipeg as they host the Montreal Canadiens this week? Well, not to be flippant, but the last team that they haven't played yet this year. I'm looking forward to seeing a fresh team, albeit they've only seen the Toronto Maple Leafs once, of course, right? But now you get to see the other of the six teams, the last of the six that you're going to play for the 56 game schedule and the Montreal Canadiens. And certainly I think whenever the two franchises have gotten together, 1.0, 2.0, there's always something special about it, especially in Western Canada. You're not going to have that fan base and you're not going to see all those Habs jerseys in Winnipeg or, or certainly the, the faithful that follow when Winnipeg goes to Montreal. But I'm really looking forward to this one because these two teams have kind of been on a collision course for a little while. And while Montreal is four, five, and one in their last 10 going into this week, and they've stumbled a little bit from that hot start, and the Winnipeg Jets appear to be getting hot right now, Montreal also on the road is 6-0-3. Oh, I mean, they've had points in all nine games and haven't surrendered a full two points without garnering one at least on the road themselves. So they've turned themselves into a real good road team. They've got a great goaltending tandem and Carey Price and Jake Allen. They've got a big defense, and that's going to be something to watch 
watch from the Winnipeg Jets to try to navigate through in Weber, Edmondson, Sherratt, Jeff Petrie as well, who's one of their top scorers. So there's a ruggedness to their back end. They've got some guys that can play up front. Brendan Gallagher being one, he can score and he can get under your skin. Tyler Toffoli, 11 goals. He's a bigger body. Josh Anderson, kind of a reclamation project picked up and he's scoring as well. Corey Perry adds some more sandpaper to that forward core. So the little Montreal Canadians that we remember from a few years ago are no longer that. They're built, I think, to be a little bit more of a team that's going to get in your face and be physical, and they can back it up as well. So you've got two teams here separated by two points, Winnipeg at 23 going into the series, Montreal at 21. Montreal does have a game in hand, a very important, or as we maybe say, if you are in bilingual classes, Trey's important. You know, we could say going into this one <laughs> for both teams, but I really like the match. I really think that this is going to be a good test, especially for the Jets guys from the standpoint, okay, let's see where you are. You've beaten up on Ottawa a little bit. You know, you've gotten Vancouver a few times here now. You kind of split with Edmonton. You've got Calgary. So you've taken some of the teams that you needed to beat and beat them. Now you've got a team above the playoff line like you are. You're going to see them in a two-game series. You haven't seen them this year. What do you have and how far have you come along? I'm really looking forward to this starting on Thursday night. Mitchell, you know, a pile of players for the Winnipeg Jets right now have just been on absolute tears. You know, we've talked about Mark Scheifele, Lauren Bassois, Pierre-Luc Dubois even. Another player that's really come on strong here, especially in the month of February, is Neil Pionk. Obviously, he gets the goal in Vancouver and he hits 100 points for his NHL career. He picks up two goals, three assists on the road trip. Both goals he scored were absolute rockets. Just what have you seen from Neil Pionk that's allowed him to not only produce offense, but just be an extremely strong defender in his own zone? So now I, I fully understand that players, you know, during the off season and, and the extended off season that uh, all the teams had this year work on things. Did he work on his slap shot? Because last year when he pointed on the power play, like he'd shoot the puck and, you know, he, he scored a few goals that way, but I mean, you look at the one in Edmonton, Mike Smith had a clean look and didn't touch the thing. Like it was in and out real quick. And then Brayden Holpe barely moved. I think he was partially screened on, on the power play goal. But man, like Pionk's slap shot seems to have an extra few uh, miles per hour in it. And you mentioned the the month that he's having. He's got points in his last in nine of his last 10 games. I mean, he's been paired with Derek Forbert this season. I think that continuity has been helpful. Um, they fully understand each other's game that perhaps that allows Neil Pionk to jump up a little bit and heading into Monday. I mean, he's tied for fifth in the NHL among defensemen and points with 15. I mean, I, he's just having a, a fantastic year. And so now he's got 60 points with the jets and you mentioned the hundred points that he has in his career. I mean, he, he got to 60 faster than he got to 40 with the Rangers. It's not a knock on the Rangers. It just shows the development that he's had over the last couple seasons and in the defensive zone, I mean, he's throwing his body around and he's throwing it all over the ice. I mean, he's got 43 hits at second on the Jets, only behind Adam Lowry, and that's nine clear of third place. So this is a guy that seems to be doing it all over the ice for the Winnipeg Jets in every aspect. And you mentioned the defensive zone as well. He's one of only two Jets that has a positive shot attempt differential uh, at five on five, which is important. You know, like this is a, a Jets team that's always trying to improve how they're playing in their defensive zone. They're wanting to reduce those, those high risk, uh, high danger chances against. And Neil Pionk has been a, a big part of that. Of course he can move the puck, but he's a guy that seems to be winning those puck battles uh, in the Jets zone. And he's doing it, you know, in a number of ways. And some of that includes being physical. So I just think he's, he's had just a, a real strong start, especially a real strong February. And uh, the more he continues to do that, the better it is for the Jets. Gentlemen, I know you were both up late on Sunday night covering the Winnipeg Jets and Vancouver Canucks game. Uh, you know, luckily I was in Vancouver, so my time zones aren't too messed up, but uh, I feel for you, gentlemen. <laughs> it's Monday. It's 549 as we record this. Get off the internet and go to bed, please. Yes. Bed by 630. All right. <laughs> not, not, not for a few more hours yet, because I'll be up too early. Okay, that's yeah, fair. All right, I'll, I'll allow it. Yeah. All right, gentlemen, All right. the Winnipeg I'll Jets practice. <laughs> okay. Ooh, nice. 
<laughs> the Winnipeg Jets practice this week, and then obviously Thursday they get things going against the Montreal Canadiens. Thanks so much for listening to Ground Control. Have a great one. This is Big Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets, hosted by Jets TV. For Jets news, videos, and more, head to winnipegjets.com. 